this is the Provoke Prawn, and in this video I'm going to show you how to build a budget gaming PC inside the NZXT H7. In this video I'm going to show you the steps for building a PC, and I'll leave all the specifications of the machine in the description, but I'm going to show you all the various steps for building in it, and it's a really straightforward build, but I want to talk to you about the various different parts of it, why I'm using them, and also the results that I got out of it. I'm going to do some separate videos on all the different parts in more depth. So if you want to find out more about each of the things, for example, the graphics card is an Intel Arc A770. And I'm also going to be setting up a motherboard in here, which is an NZXT motherboard, which is the N5 Z690. So it's an Intel 12th gen motherboard, which has PCIe NVMe slots on it. It supports DDR4 RAM. You can use, see I'm using Kingston Fury Beast RAM here alongside a Kingston Fury Renegade NVMe. I'm also using an i5 13600K CPU from Intel which is budget friendly, alongside a nice setup with a simple cooler from Deepcool, which is the AG400, either white or black. I'm actually using both, but more on that later on. And I'm going to show the setup process for all these different things and talk about them as we go through. There are only a couple of bits of RGB in this build. That's the fan on the cooler, the RGB RAM, and also some RGB on the GPU as well. There are no RGB case fans, which makes life a lot easier in terms of setup. And it also keeps the price down because I'm mostly just going to be using the fans that are included in the build. So you can find out about that. Also, Intel's Arc A770 is obviously the limited edition version, which is available for a very reasonable price when compared to the other art graphics cards on the market. If you're looking for 1080p or 1440p, this is a good option. And I've actually been testing it out and found it's capable of running 4K on some games as well. So it's really affordable and a nice feature of this build. And here you can see some of the end results with the case kind of naked and on display. But you can see I'm basically going to end up with three fans on the front, one on the rear, and then obviously the CPU cooler and the GPU as well. Now this case itself has a sort of limited cooling because it's mostly closed off. You can see there's a sort of side intake vent here. And you think that this would run a bit hot. So I've actually done some videos in the past and previous NZXT cases, which did run a bit hot. But this one was actually not too bad. And because of the setup in here, it's not that hot either. And I am going to be doing a video on the NZXT H7 Flow in the near future, which does have better airflow. So if you're curious, I'd recommend sticking around for that and subscribing if you haven't already. But you can see that this case is actually quite roomy. And it does have space to build and install a variety of things in, including multiple SSDs and hard disk drives if you want to do that. I'm going to show you the steps for SSDs in this build and other things, but we're mostly going to be sticking to that one NVMe SSD just to keep the budget and cost down and to still deliver the goods in terms of gaming performance because the uh, Gen 4 NVMe SSDs are fast and reasonably priced if you buy the right size as well, and they should give you good storage and plenty of speed for loading windows and games too. You can see the case can be stripped down with all the different parts coming off basically the top sides, front and rear, makes it a lot easier to build in and to access all the different things. You do have the option to install different things in here. Obviously it will take 360 mil radiator potentially on the top. I'm not going to be using an all-in-one cooler this time though. We're going for air cooling for simplicity. And this setup is remarkably simple, as you'll see as we go through. But you can see that basically the case only comes with two fans as standard. Now you can purchase these fans separately. And I've actually harvested some from a previous build. They're basically really straightforward fans and give good enough cooling for decent enough performance as well. If you're interested in the cooling performance, be sure to come back and check out the cooler video. Because I'm going to do a separate thing on that as well as obviously on the graphics card. So you can see the performance there, but you'll see as standard, you only get two fans. You really need to add more in. And so I'm adding two extra ones into the front. I'm going to show you the process for doing that. But you will see plenty of space in here. It's a pretty spacious case. There should be enough room if you want to mount a 360 mil radiator at the top. And also at the back, there's quite a lot of cable channeling. So you've got these two main chain channels on the left and in the middle there for running various cables through. And it's pretty roomy. You also have, you can see that there's two SSD brackets back there. And then down the bottom, there's a hard disk drive bay as well, which I'll show you a bit later on what to do there. 
But then there we have all the bagged cables. I'm also going to show you all the steps where these cables plug in a bit later on. But there's USB cable, this big fat one, USB-C front panel connectors and front panel audio connectors. And then you have a cardboard box tucked into the bottom of the hard disk drive tray, which has extra things in it, including more cages and loads of different screws. And one of the nice things about this build actually is that all the little bags are labeled and you'll see that there is labeling on them to tell you what screws are inside or at least what size they are. And if you look inside the box, you'll also find an instruction manual which then lists out what screws are for what. So it does a really straightforward build. There's also some cable ties for tidying things up. So if you do have a lot of cables, you can keep things nice and neat. Here you can see the reference for the accessory box and what's included in those screws. You get extra fan screws. You get screws for screwing the motherboard down, PSU screws for installing the power supply unit, and extra standoffs depending on what motherboard you're using. I know mean, you're using an ATX motherboard in this, so you don't actually need any extras, but it will fit with a variety of different motherboards. I'll leave all the specs in the description as well as links to the official site so you can find out more. But here you can see the screws I'm going to be using for installing extra fans. So these are the KB5 X10 millimeter screws. And as I said, I'm using the same fans that are installed in the case already. And I'll leave the information on that in the description as well. And basically what I'm going to do is install two more on the front to match that single one that's already there. You will see when you have it at this position, so it's currently laid on its back up in the air, and you can see that you can run the cables through to the back and there's actually several gaps back there for doing so. What we're doing is we're putting these fans facing towards the front so they're pulling cold air in through the front. It will then run through and up out the top and through the back. There are two screws at the top on the front of the fan tray here. So you're on, they're on the left hand side here, but that's actually the top of the case. Unscrew those and then you can take the fan tray out to make life a bit easier for mounting purposes. Because what I found is it's fine to screw in the top fan, but the bottom one you can't actually access because of the hard drive cage. So you do actually need to take this out. So just remove this tray by unscrewing those two little screws at the top and then you're off. So you can then remove that tray and then obviously just install the extra fans that you want to on it. And now obviously I'm using these sort of standard non-RGB fans. You do have the option to use other fans. You don't have to stick with the NZXT ones. But to save money and keep the budget down, we're going to be using these. And obviously this will reduce the overall cost, but should still deliver good performance. These extra fans will be beneficial because obviously one could potentially be blowing towards your power supply unit and your hard disk drives if you have them at the bottom. And also just extra airflow across the GPU and motherboard will be helpful. Now we have three cables. Now it's worth noting that these can be plugged into the system fan headers on your motherboard. I'll show you some of those later on. But I also have this splitter cable. So you can see I've got a cable here which has three connections on it that go into a single one. This makes life a lot easier because you can connect these up and then you can just plug them single connector into the motherboard and then that motherboard connector will then control all three fans and give you the power for all of them. And you can then also access that via your motherboard software into the BIOS and other things to basically control the fan speed. This is a separate purchase, but I'll leave a link in the description to options on what you can do. You can get Y splitters for putting two cables together, or you can get a triple, for example, there. And then you can see the single connection plugs into the system fan header, which on this motherboard is on the right-hand side, right next to the RAM. But you'll find various different ones. They're usually labeled SIS and then a number. So SIS1, SIS2, SIS3, SIS4. You should have multiples, and you probably have got enough single connections to be able to connect up multiple fans. So I've only got four fans here that I'm installing, three on the front, one on the rear. Each of those is plug into the SIS fan headers on the motherboard. And the downside of that, of course, is that you have a lot more cables running through to the front and it looks a bit messy. If you use this triple setup that I've got essentially splitting three cables into one, it means you can run the mess of cables to the rear and then just one cable through to the front. Makes life a little bit neater and a little bit less hassle as well if you're trying to keep things tidy and result in good airflow at the front of the case. So you can see I'm running them through to the back there and then that enables me to just hide them up away through the cable channeling. And obviously I'm going to connect up that three pronged cable that I showed you earlier on. These are relatively easy to get hold of and they will work nice and easy. You just connect those up and then you've got a single fan connection instead of three, which is much more convenient.
Now, you'll see that there's a lot of cables at the rear already coming from the top. Those are all the front connections that you'll need to connect up to the motherboard in terms of the front panel USB and also HD audio and front panel power connections. Don't worry, I will show you where those go later on as well. Now, there are some other screws included in here. You can see these are M3 screws and again refer to the manual for this but you can basically take out this little trays here now if you're installing a 2.5 inch ssd you obviously have the option of installing two here and there are extra trays included for installation elsewhere in the case obviously to keep budget down as i said i'm basically going to be using one kingston drive this is actually quite a small and affordable drive and i'm doing it for demonstration purposes so you take that tray out with a one screw that's held in place and then you just need to install the drive so it's facing in the right direction face it downwards so that the cables can plug into the bottom of it and then use those four screws to screw it into the tray and then attach reattach the tray to the back you obviously have the option to use multiples of these and they are relatively affordable and compared to the mvme drive so if you want to save money you could actually buy a bigger ssd they're not as fast and they do require a bit more in terms of the cabling because you need a data cable and a SATA power connection. But I'll show you both of those later on and where they connect to. And it just clips back in place and then re-screws with the screw you took out earlier to hold that in place. So you could you could put two in here if you wanted to. You could have two SSDs to give double the storage capacity. Now there's a hard disk drive mounting bracket down the bottom here. So you can potentially install platter hard drives as well. It's held in place with thumb screws. And it is a bit of a mission to get out. If you're not going to be using it, I'd actually suggest taking it out entirely because it would give you more space for your power supply cables and also just leads a little bit better airflow down the bottom because it won't restrict things. And that's really easy to do as well. Now, I am using a C850 Gold from NZXT power supply unit in this case. I'm going to do a video separately on this if you want to find out all about it and all the different things that are included because I'm basically just going to cover the cables that we need for this build in this video not everything else that's included because there are a lot of other cables included as you can see here it allows you to connect up all sorts of peripherals and other things but i'm going to be keeping the cables to a minimum so we're using the fat 24 pin power supply cable as the first one and that plugs in on the top left you can see motherboard and 20 plus 4 so you have the 20 on the left and then the 4 on the right and basically I'd recommend plugging in the cables to the power supply unit before you install it in the case. This makes life a lot easier because it's less fiddly and it also ensures that you can clip everything in. You've got to make sure you push them all in until they click. They have little clips that hold them in place. You want to make sure they're secured nicely. Plug that one in and then I'm going to show you where it will plug in now. But don't do it on the motherboard just yet. This is just for demonstration purposes. So once it's in the case and everything else is installed, you'd connect it up and plug it in here on the right hand side. And again, you've got to make sure that clicks into place properly. It's really important because that gives the motherboard the power that it needs. On this motherboard, you also need two CPU power connectors. So you can see the cables are marked CPU on this one, and they plug in on the top right where it says CPU and PCIe. So the CPU end goes in the motherboard, and the other end plugs into the power supply unit. So just plug those in here, and then... We're going to plug them in on the top left of the motherboard. Again, I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes outside the case to make it a bit easier to see and just to know where to plug things in. Don't plug the cables into the motherboard like this just yet, but this is demo purposes. So those two cables are plugging at the top. You can see one's an eight pin. So you plug that cable in there and then the other one's just four. And you will find that this varies from motherboard to motherboard. So in this motherboard, it uses uh, eight and then a four. And some others I've seen it use two eights and you, it varies, so it's worth watching out for. So you can basically just pull this cable apart and now you've got a four connector instead of an eight. And again, the same sort of process. Watch out for that clip because you can see each of these cables has a little clip on it. You need to make sure that you seat that cable properly in there and then it will click when you've done so. So it doesn't accidentally pop out and it will make sure that you've got enough power running through. Now that is the standard connections for the motherboard, so that's what you need for motherboard power. This is the SATA power connection. This is a flat connector, and you can see that plugs in where the peripheral and SATA connections are on the bottom row of the power supply unit there on the left-hand side. And this is used for the hard drives, so for the SSDs, hard drives, and it also is used for fan controllers. It has a daisy chain effect, so there are several different connectors on that cable, which means that you can connect up multiple different devices. Now, I don't actually need a fan controller, but you might. So depending on what you're doing, if you're not following this exact build, 
then you might be using, I don't know, something like NZXT fan controller or here's a Lian Li one that I've got that has a flat connector on it and that connects in there. And you can connect more than one thing. So you could connect up multiple drives with the SSDs or hard drives or you could connect up an SSD and a fan controller. You do have the option. So you might only we need one cable. So that's worth bearing in mind. So that's those things. And then the other thing that's important, obviously, with a gaming PC is the graphics card. And that's a PCIe connection. And again, you want the PCIe cable, the smart PCIe. We'll plug it in in the bottom right here where it says CPU and PCIe. Now, this is going to vary depending on the GPU you're using. The Arc graphics card that I'm using only has a couple of connectors. And you can see there's a daisy chain effect on this cable that has two connectors on it. So we can use that or you can use two single ones and connect them up. You might have a graphics card which requires more depending on the build. But you can see these cables are sort of pushed apart and you need to pinch them together so there's a clip on it. Basically this means that you can either use it sort of 8 pin power connect mode or in a 6 pin. And funnily enough this one has an 8 and a 6. So one of them needs to be squashed together and plugged in and the other one just has that split in it. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. Because I'm going to show you from different angles. But again, clips on them. So you've got to make sure they click into place properly. So you can see this one. You sort of got to push it together and hold it together as you push it in to make sure the eight all go in. But then the other cable is just a six connector. So we can just leave those two sort of loose hanging. Looks a bit messy, but that's how it works. And that's the connection for it. So again, just make sure everything's plugged in that you're going to need to make sure it's fully built before you start this process of actually installing this power supply unit in the case and make sure all those cables are pushed all the way in it. And then you'll find the hexagon screws, 632 times 6, there's four of those, and those are used for mounting the PSU in the case. Power supply unit fits in the bottom of the case with the fan facing downwards. That's because it's sucking air from the bottom of the case into it to keep it cool and then blowing hot air out the rear. So you can see it's got some large feet on this case, which just allows for sucking air in really easily. There's also some ventilation down there and a dust cover as well. So it should allow for good airflow. So you just basically got to put this into place. And you can see without the hard disk drive tray in there, there's a lot more room for cables. I don't actually have a lot of cables, but if you're installing a lot of other things, a lot of other drives, a lot more fans, then having that extra space will be beneficial. Basically, you just install the four screws at the rear, holding it in place in the four corners or where the screw holes line up. So you can see there's actually different screw holes in here in this back of this case. And that's because it's going to fit with different power supply units, to, depending on what sort you're fitting in. But you can see where the screws are going in in this one. And then before I go any further, basically going to run the cables to where they're going to sit. So those two CPU power connectors that I showed you earlier, I'm going to use the channeling on the right hand side. Again, there's some nice Velcro ties that you can run your cables up through and in here and basically allows you to run those up out of the way and also tuck them in nice and neatly. There's some really good channeling in this case for installing the cables and just getting them seated nicely so they're ready to go when you need them to be. And then I'm going to tuck away anything else that I don't need and get the 24 pin motherboard cable. That's going to run down the middle because it's basically going to go in the middle and then plug into the motherboard when that's connected. But we can basically run it through this channeling for the moment to keep things nice and neat. And then here we have the N5Z690. Now, as I said, I'm using Kingston Fury Beast and uh, one single Renegade NVMe SSD with this. But you can actually install multiple NVMe SSDs. And I'm going to do a video separately, go into a bit more depth on this motherboard. It's a Wi-Fi motherboard, so it has Wi-Fi on it. It's DDR4, which is an important part of Note. And it's a 12th gen motherboard, but it actually will work with 13th gen CPUs as well. And you can get BIOS updates from NZXT directly from their website for such a thing. And I'm going to show a video separately on how to do that and what's involved. But we're installing an NVMe SSD, so I'm going to use the top slot. You can see I've actually got a crucial drive installed further down. Uh, it's just for demonstration purposes, but there are multiple mounting points on here for doing that. Take that cover off, remove the little plastic sticker that sits over the top of that heat shielding, and then we're going to install this Renegade drive. This is an NVMe, PCIe NVMe Gen 4 drive, so it should be nice and fast, which means perfect for installing Windows on, because that means Windows will load quickly, but also your games. It installs by clipping in and the top here, you can see that. And then usually these drivers are held in place with a screw, but the screws on this one actually go through the shielding. So you can see me just reseat that shielding and then you basically put the screws back in place and that holds the shield down and the driver at the same time into that standoff screw. So it allows you to secure it because it's got to be secured, but it doesn't require any cables. 
either power or any data cables, which is a lot easier than SSDs or NVMe. So if you're trying to sort of build a PC like this and to make it less complicated, these drives are actually a lot easier to do than your standard drives. Now we're installing the CPU. So the first thing to do is just to remove that lever, lift it up and lift that catch up there. And then you can see uh, the, the pins underneath. Now you need to take real care here because those pins can be easily damaged if you apply too much pressure. But we're going to put the CPU in with the gold arrow in the bottom left pointing down and gently seat it down in there. And then you basically just replace the cover and then reseat the lever. And as you do that, the little black plastic cover will pop off. Don't panic. That was just to protect the pins while it was in transit. And now you can remove that and it's basically just put that lever down and that will secure that in place. Now, if you notice, I'm actually using a Core i7-12700K at the moment, but that's because I'm going to swap the CPUs over and do a separate video on that. So don't panic. And then there's Kingston Fury Beast RAM, and this needs to be installed in A2 and B2 slots on the motherboard. So you basically press the little buttons at the top to release the catches and then put the RAM in the right places. I'm using two sticks in this build, but you could potentially fill it up with more if you wanted to. So you could do four. And I've done a video separately on things to know about RAM and things to do with RAM when you're installing it and afterwards. So that's worth checking out. I'll leave all the relevant links in the description to other videos that might be useful during your build process and also once you've installed Windows and other things too. But you can see we're getting most of this process done now. And now we're going to use a cooler. Now I'm using this cooler because it's not a particularly hot CPU that we're going to end up with. Also, it's really easy installation process and it will give a pretty nice aesthetic. It has a single RGB fan on it. Deep Cool is really well known for building good quality coolers. And this is sort of a quiet and easy installation option versus an all-in-one cooler. It comes with its own back plate, which is adaptable via various different clips on the corners and it'll actually work with various different sockets so in this case it's LGA 1700 you need to just push the pins out to the far corners to go through Now this goes on the back of the motherboard and pushes through into the front and then you need these little standoff caps to sit over the top of those holes and I'll show you more of what I mean in a minute but it's worth noting in the box there's two different sorts so you can see on the right 11 5x and then on the left, you have these ones with notches on, which is the 1700. So this is a 1700 socket motherboard. So we need the 1700 standoffs. And basically that bracket pushes through from the rear, as I'm about to show you. Those sit over the top. And that basically ensures that the sort of bracketing and the CPU is going to sit really nicely when you go about the installation process. So this back plate just go pushes through here. And it's worth doing all this when it is outside the case because it makes the process a lot easier than having to sort of hold things up when they're in the case and it just makes it a lot more straightforward to do it's just take real care while you're doing it and basically you can see those pins pushing through on each of the four corners there now and what we need to do is basically seat these little caps over the top of them and then we're going to put down a mounting bracket over the top of that this will allow for excellent cooling of the cpu but also very little faff because there's only two cables that need to be plugged in from the cooler as well and it gives a little extra RGB if you're into that, because as I said earlier, there isn't much RGB in this build. So it's kind of keeping it pretty subtle, especially when you've got that tinted glass on at the end. So now this has a little bracket that seats down over the top. And then that has two little screws that I'm holding onto at the moment where the cooler sits on top of. It's actually a fairly straightforward installation process. And I'm going to go into more depth on it and the full unboxing of that cooler if you want to find out, as well as tests to see the performance of it and how much heat it churns out and other things. Obviously, it's designed to disperse heat from the CPU and keep it running cool. And it will be a good test of how this case performs. But the installation process is really straightforward. The brackets sits at the top. Those screws then screw down into the back plate that we've put in place. So you basically just need to go through and seat those down and make sure they're nice and tight. And this allows for a good mounting of the cooler on top of the CPU, because it's obviously very important that you get this cooler mounted down so there's a good contact between the CPU and the copper plate that's on the cooler itself. Otherwise, you won't get the cooling that you need out of it. And if your CPU runs too hot, you will find you're underperforming. So it's an important point to check that it's working properly.
So essentially what you're going to do is basically just put the cooler down like this. Now again, what we've got to do here is make sure the fans are facing the same direction. So the fan faces towards the front of the case so that it's sucking cold air from the front that's being pulled in and then blown through the radiator and sucked out of the rear. And that way everything's working as it should. If you did it the other way around, for example, your fans would then be fighting each other and that would be a problem. So now we need some thermal paste. There's a little tiny bag of thermal paste included in the box. Now people will argue about how to install thermal paste and how much you need. Most would say put a pea size amount sort of like this in the middle and then just put the cooler on top of it. I personally like to spread it out because it's important that there's a good spread of thermal paste across the entirety of the CPU. You just need to make sure there's a thin layer across the entire CPU so there's good contact because what it does is it ensures good thermal conductivity between the CPU and the cooler. If it's not entirely covered, that could lead to problems. Now, usually putting a pea size amount in there will squash it out as you install it, so it's fine to do it that way, but you need to make sure there's good contact, basically. And if you find, as sometimes people will do, that the CPU is running too hot, it may well be the case that there's not enough thermal paste or the thermal paste hasn't spread out properly. So one of the solution is to take the cooler off, check the contact uh, where the thermal paste is and look for any gaps where there isn't any. And that could just be as simple as that. You just need to sort it out or that this the cooler isn't quite seated down properly. So make sure you screw this in nice and tight. It's held onto that bracket, obviously. So it's fairly easy to install and just make sure you can't go any further and be gentle and careful while doing it. And then you have a CPU fan connection. So you'll see there's a CPU fan connector right next to the RAM here at the top. And we're going to plug that cable in there. I'm just showing a close up of it so you can see where that is. And then we're going to plug that in and that will allow for the motherboard to control the fan speed and to keep the temps down of your CPU. Simple connection and you push that in and then as I said there's only other one other cable on this cooler and that's for the RGB and that one actually is a bit more fiddly because I do find it's not quite long enough and you'll see what I mean in a second but essentially you have to run that to the bottom and connect it up to the 5 volt RGB header that's on the bottom of this motherboard. Now where yours is might vary but on this motherboard it's in the bottom sort of middle down here and you can see it has three pins that match up and it says 5 volt ARGB1 on it. So you can see that on the bottom left there. There's also a 12 volt RGB header, but that has four pins. So don't try and use that. You just basically push that into place. And one, that's all set up. That will then allow your motherboard to control the RGB lighting over the cooler. So now we have basically the motherboard's entirely set up. We've got the RAM set up, the CPU's ready to go, NVMe's installed. Now we've just got to get it in the case. So we already have the case prepared with the three fans on the front and the one at the rear, and we're just installing the motherboard now. So you basically just have to gently and carefully push it in downwards with that back facing towards the rear so that the back USB ports and other things push through the holes there, the IO slots going through there, and basically seat it down over the various standoffs. So there are little standoff screws in here which stick to the back of the motherboard basically where the holes are and then you use these six by 32 five millimeter screws to screw those down there are multiple points there should be about nine different points on here where you need to put those screws through screw holes along the bottom in the middle and at the top and you'll basically you need to ensure that it's tightly in installed and screwed down so that the motherboard's well secured to the case and it isn't going to move around and you can see the steps for doing that here. But you can see there's plenty of space here as well. So I know already noted that you could install a radiator on the top. You could potentially install one on the front, although I wouldn't generally recommend that. Top mounting is preferable if you're going through an all-in-one cooler system instead of using a single for the CPU cooler like I am, then that is an option that you have plenty of space up there. So now what I'm doing is I'm installing those CPU power cables that I showed you earlier on. So I run them from the rear through that gap and then install them up the top left here uh, for easy installation. Don't forget, there's one 8-pin and one 4-pin, so you actually need to make sure they're split. It's important to ensure all these power cables are connected up properly, uh, otherwise your motherboard won't power on. Now, I showed you the process for installing the SSD power earlier on, but this is the data connector, so that connects up one end to the drive and then the other end installs on the right hand side down in the middle-ish you can see where that plugs into here 
and that allows for the data transfer from the drive to the motherboard and such. And then these other connectors. So this is the front panel USB connector that you saw earlier on in the plastic bag right at the beginning. That plugs in on the right hand side. Again, I'm demoing this outside the case just for ease of viewing. You can see that plugs in there. And then you've got the USB-C connection. So you need to make sure you plug that in. If you want to use the top panel USB-A or USB-C connections, you have to plug those two connectors in. And they run from the front just behind the tray. And I'll show you where in a second. And then there's the front panel connector. This goes down the bottom here. And you can see it basically does the power reset and power LED connectors. You can only plug it in one way because there's only some holes and then there's some pins that match up and there's some that don't so it's, you can't really get it the wrong way around and then the hd audio is the 3.5 mil connection on the top front as well and that plugs in and the bottom left so you just run all these cables from the front up uh, at the bottom and then plug them into the various different points if you need a usb connection which is for basically the fan controllers so if you use an nzxt fan controller or rgb strips or something like that has a usb connection on it that would plug in here. You have a single USB connection there. You can get USB splitters if you need extras, which is worth bearing in mind, but we don't need it in this case. Now there's a system fan connection in the bottom right here. So that's SysFan 4. You can use that to connect up what the front free fans that I suggested, or there are other various other connections around. We also need to connect up that rear fan. So that rear single fan, that needs to be connected up too. You can see I've now plugged in the 24 pin motherboard power supply cable on the right hand side I've also got USB-C plugged in and the data cable so you can see basically going through the process you'll notice there's a tray there on the right hand side which basically blocks a view of the cables so you can actually keep things looking pretty neat and tidy in this case so I'm basically hiding them behind that tray and then connecting them up into the motherboard and then what I like to do is to just turn it on and make sure everything's running as it should be. And this is worth doing because you obviously want to make sure everything's powering on. And what I noticed immediately was that I'd forgotten to plug in the rear fan. But you can see CPU spinning up nicely. CPU fan, front fans are spinning up. The RGB's on, on the RAM as well. So it pretty much looks like it's going to be running just fine. So I just made sure that cable is connected up. Now it's actually run through some of the cable management systems uh, initially when you unbox the case first of all so basically you have to just take that cable out and then find a system fan header on the motherboard that you can plug it into i found one that was on the top right and so we just run it through the top there and then just plug it in the top right there and connect that up so that then has the fan control sorted for the front fans and the rear ones again remember to make sure they're all installed so they're facing in the same direction but you can see you have system fan on the top right here as an option on the right hand side of the RAM. Next step is to go through the process of installing the graphics card. So I made sure everything was working properly there. I obviously need a GPU to make sure that we can power our monitor and get a view. This is the Intel Arc A770. We make sure you install it in the top PCIe X16 slot. So it's the long one. You can see where it slots in here because that will give you the fastest speed. There are a couple of other slots, but usually if you use those other ones, you'll find that your GPU isn't running at its maximum performance, so it's actually better to install it up here. Also, it will allow for better cooling because the fans on the GPU, just like the PSU, pull, power, pull air in from the bottom to cool it and then run the air through the GPU and out the back to keep things running cool. So you need to make sure it's got plenty of air. Also, once you've secured it in place, and clicked it down into that PCIe slot, make sure you then re-screw in the screws that are on there. Now this GPU also has a RGB connection, so you can see me connecting up that RGB connector here, and that is RGB on this end, but then USB on the other end. So that connects up there and then plugs in in the middle of the bottom of the motherboard. You don't have to connect it, it's not essential, but if you want that nice RGB lighting that you saw at the beginning, then you will want to use it. So this is USB connection and you'll use Intel's software in order to control this rather than the RGB on your motherboard. Then you just need to make sure that the cable's tucked away because it's a bit awkward to get into a nice position. Then we'll make sure we run those PCIe cables that I showed you earlier on through. So we have the eight pin and then the six pin basically need to be plugged in again and make sure that they're seated correctly. And also just make sure that they're plugged in fully all the way and that you hear that click when doing so. 
But now we're basically at the end of the build. We have the majority of it done. Now, obviously, you need to go through the process of installing Windows. That's a separate video in its entirety. And I recommend looking around for one of those. But basically, you just need to create a bootable media drive on a thumbstick and then install Windows that way. And do a separate video on how to update the BIOS on this motherboard if you're installing a, another CPU like a more recent one and also some tips on that so be sure to check that out if you need help with those things well this is the process for the first part of the installation and we now have a nice complete case with a glorious RGB and a wonderful bit of processing power and this actually is surprisingly good for the money as well. So it's a pretty affordable machine. I'll leave all the links in the description to everything that's included in there so you can find out the build cost in your area. But it should be pretty reasonable considering the cost of the GPU was £400, which is remarkable when you consider how much NVIDIA and AMD's offerings are at the moment. And it's one of, one of the good options. Also, NZXT things are pretty affordable. And the end result... Is a nice looking machine. I hope you'll agree. I'm pretty pleased with it. It's come together quite nicely. And it lacks the RGB that you'd usually see in a lot of my builds, but it should still deliver the goods. And also it has some nice accents to it. Although to be honest, they're mostly going to be hidden behind the glass because it does have tinted glass on it, as you'll see in a second. And some of the RGB you don't see because it's actually below the GPU anyway, but it does have a little bit of a nifty glow in it from various different angles hopefully you found this video useful let me know in the comments if you've got any questions be sure to come back and check out the video on the arc a770 because i'm going to a bit of depth on that i want to talk about how it's a good option not just because of the looks but also because i was surprised that it managed to run games at 4k and relatively smoothly so you can see me playing escape from tarkov here for example that's in 4k with the graphics turned up as well i also did a variety of tests on other games now don't get me wrong it's not going to run 4k at ultra settings on a lot of games but it does work and it will work really well with 1080p games as well so if you've got a 1080p monitor and you want an affordable gpu and an affordable pc then this is an option thanks very much for watching i hope it was useful a big shout out to my YouTube members who help support the channel and help me create content like this. Why not click that join button and find out the benefits of being a member? Thanks for watching. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.